preying on all our human weaknesses uh. because it's uh, give, it's saying things that appear to us to be plausible and very human-like, and then that that engenders um, uh, in 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 our in our minds in a very well-documented way this our own generalization. If it can converse and uh, in this way, then in a human-like fashion, it has these other human capabilities that I do as well, which it very much doesn't. Is it up to the machine to say stop saying we? It's just you. Like, you know, don't give me a name. I'm just a machine. Or is it up to the person to to um, not do that? Yeah. Well, our our research shows that um, uh, there's uh, there's an important role to be played on the on the part of the machine in acting so as to effectively calibrate trust um, of a human interacting with it. In a factory setting, CNC operators, you know, technically they don't need to learn manual machining because the machine's always going to make the cuts. But they learn ma every machining you know, course, they're going to teach you the principles of manual machining, even though you don't have to do it. And it's not because they really expect you to do it on your own, but it's, like, it's this idea of learning how to understand what a quality part looks like, what principles the machine's actually using when it's going through the tasks, and that makes you a better programmer and a better quality person, person down the line. You can really free people up to be more creative and to, to take jobs that have become worse and worse over time, including some factory jobs that no longer pay as well as they used to compared to alternatives, and make them significantly better right. and more interesting and more creative. It's the, it's the AI paradox, which is that once AI works, you don't call it AI anymore. <laughs> the AI is like the biggest circle of the Venn diagram of like what we work on. So you know, like voice recognition technology, like when you're like uh, option three on the phone, like once that was AI and then it just became, you know, something we interacted with in the phone on a daily basis and it just worked. Hey, and welcome back to Invisible Machines. As Rob Wilson and I were working on our book, Age of Invisible Machines, we kept returning to certain ideas over and over again. One of them being that the goal with uh, conversational AI and hyper automation isn't to replicate the ways that people already do things. It's to use these technologies to find better ways of automating certain processes. And that the path to creating those automations often involves direct input from the people who best understand how those tasks are currently being completed. That isn't to say that this technology is meant to replace those people. The goal should really be to uh, enhance their capabilities, uh, give them more free time uh, for creative problem solving, which is something that humans excel at. And you know, part of that creative problem solving energy can be poured into further refining the automations that were designed in the first place so that it creates kind of a, a nice loop where humans, they're helping machines become better machines and machines in becoming better machines are helping humans become better humans. Uh, so we were really excited when we found an article in Harvard Business Review, a recent article called A Smarter Strategy for Using Robots that confirms that these same uh, considerations have to be applied when working with machines that aren't invisible, with uh, machines in manufacturing uh, and other aspects of robotics. So today we are really excited to bring you a conversation with the authors of that article, Julie Shaw and Ben Armstrong. So Ben Armstrong is the executive director and a research scientist at MIT's Industrial Performance Center. And Julie Shaw is the H.N. Slater Professor of Aeronautics and Astronomics at MIT. She leads the Interactive Robotics Group and along with Ben, co-leads the work of the Future Initiative. So this is a really cool conversation. We, we spent some time talking about uh, the things that I mentioned at the top of the intro, but we also get into anthropomorphism and how uh, it can create pitfalls when designing with uh, these technologies. We also talk a bit about how to calibrate the relationship between humans and machines in different settings. And we talk about the term artificial intelligence and how like the term UX, AI uh, is a bit too broad to use in a lot of discussions about this technology and can actually cause some confusion. So this is an exciting conversation. Uh, one quick note before we jump in, uh, Ben Armstrong was having a bit of computer trouble as we got rolling, so he, he joins the discussion uh, a little late, um, and you'll notice that, but hey, this is a good one. Enjoy. Enjoy. 
All right, Julie, uh, thanks so much for yeah. joining us. <laughs> really great to see you. Uh, Rob and I were quite smitten with the article uh, yes. that you co-wrote with Ben Armstrong, uh, A Smarter Strategy for Using Robots. Um, I think what was really exciting for us, uh, having written so much about invisible machines, was to see that in the world of, of very visible machines, there's a lot of overlap in terms of, of how they should be implemented and designed. Um, I think we were we were taken with the idea that, especially that, uh, you know, they're, they're not meant, automations like this aren't meant to replicate what humans do. They're kind of more about like finding opportunities to let machines do things that they're better at humans than doing and, and how that can be kind of a symbiotic relationship between humans and machines. Uh, is that is that kind of the sense that you have of, of this technology and, and its relationship to people? That is, that is, yeah. And um, I'm a professor at MIT, and I, I'm an AI researcher. I lead a robotics lab at MIT, and um, called the Interactive Robotics Group. And so the the vision um, behind our lab's work has has always been this: is to think about how it is you can harness the relative strengths of humans and machines, um, and then also to um, to be intentional in um, uh, in developing technologies, computing technologies more broadly that are able to enhance rather than um, replace human capability, and um, uh, the uh, you know the the questions of what what that means uh, you know in terms of you know ideally we do more than you know just not replace but we are able to um, you know augment and improve human well being um, and capability in a in a variety of ways um, and uh, the. Then the question becomes, you know, how do you how do you realize that? And so, um, my my colleague at MIT, uh, Ben Armstrong, and I have um, conducted research over a number of years, looking at uh, firms that are very successful in realizing a whole host of benefits from the introduction of like physical robots as well as other types of um, you know automation systems, uh, and understanding like what those differentiators are between those that are able to adopt and scale, um, and you know increase numbers of jobs, increase wages in those jobs, increase productivity, really like the win, win, win uh, versus others that, you know, go go down a different path, either are not successful in adopting those technologies or see uh, less desirable outcomes um, uh, on on any number of those um, of, of those axes. Uh, but uh, I think you're you're exactly right. Many, many um, of these differentiators, they're, they're common to both hardware systems like robotics, as well as, you know, on, on the software side or the invisible machine side. So jobs are like designed for humans, and then, and then we automate in the way the job was designed for humans, and then we have machines behave like humans, exactly, inadvertently, yes. and then we realize that machines aren't humans, and we should design the job for a machine. And I guess there's there's a journey, right? That that these companies go on with each of those to go. Can we automate this? We just had a conversation with Aveda Samson from Google, and I was like, if I designed a machine to color for my kid's coloring book and showed it to them, they wouldn't get it. They, like, I don't understand. We're like, yeah, I designed a machine that would color the coloring book for you. You don't have to do it anymore. <laughs> you know? They're like, why? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's yeah. not my objective, right? My objective as a human isn't to color as many coloring books as I can. <laughs> um, but clearly, that was that was you know designed. That coloring book was designed for a human to do, and some jobs are designed for experience, and then some jobs are jo designed for productivity. And then we mix these up, and we start we start designing. Uh, machines to do the jobs in the way humans do them, and it makes no sense. Yeah, yeah. The um, you know the uh, illustrative example that's that's used in robotics, and you know we use in in classes as well. Is you, you think about the Roomba, which you know, everybody has some personal experience with, so it really resonates. But you, um, uh, you know, it was like maddening at first with the first Roombas deployed in our homes, and I felt this too. It's like. Uh, it, it isn't vacuuming where the mess is. Like I have a bird, there's bird seeds all over the floor and it's going to take like three hours for it to slowly like bounce its way blindly to like literally one place I need vacuumed before people come over. So you're just like, okay, never mind, And then pull out the vacuum and, and do it yourself. Um, but, you know, on the, on the flip side, if you like open your mind and conceive of like 
incorporating this Roomba into your home environment um, with the joint goal of a clean house, then you don't just vacuum right before you have people coming over. But <laughs> right. them, but it just you stays vacuumed. Like, yeah, you leave for work and ideally you don't watch it slowly bounce around the house in ways that don't make any sense. <laughs> Does like it? you're not home, ideally. You're not home. That's the way to do it. Like you set it when you're not home, so you don't have to be agitated. You know, those are the older, the older type of systems. Now there's many systems that do math, and uh, you know they're much more sophisticated in many ways. Um, uh, but you know that that system is highly successful as a vacuum cleaner. But you need to incorporate it into your into your um, your workflow and your your home life in a in a different way. Um, and then the benefit of it is you never really need to think about vacuuming again, and you just come home to to a clean a clean house. Um, but it's you know it's quite hard to take those few steps back and then um, and then uh, really ask yourself like what is that what is that larger design space? Um, how do you you need to equally redesign the human's role and the human's work to be able to when I say like design a human machine system is really what you're aiming to do here. Um, and in many settings, in, in you know, in manufacturing, we've seen um, in other settings, uh, you gain, you benefit a lot from approaching it with that that mindset. Um, uh, and you, it's a, it, it can be a real missed opportunity, really incremental gains if you look narrowly at what are the tasks the person is doing, how is it being done, how do I take pieces of that um, and automate it. Got it. Uh, where does anthropomorphism fall into a productivity-driven environment for machines? You know, and and is it like, is is the robot a, a machine, and should I give it a name, the Roomba, or or is it the whole system of robots in my house a name? Is there a self? Is there a danger to even insinuating there's a self? Yeah. So anthropomorphism is really <laughs> interesting to me. So um, you know, people uh, attribute like human-like qualities to things that aren't even anthropomorphic, like our industrial robots and lab. They're just like standard so orange industrial robots and our people come in, they interact with them. And then over the course of maybe even like a half hour, they feel like bonded to this industrial robot. They'll give it a name. They'll talk about it, you know, with its name that they've given it as they're providing their, you know, responses to us on, on working with the system. Um, the, um, you know, there's a, there is a danger to, um, to, it's very easy to trigger that type of response in a person. Um, and there is, um, you know, a flip side of that, which is, you know, you you actually don't want your robots to be too cute. You don't want to do this for like the cuteness factor because there's this well-documented phenomena um, on faculty in the aerospace department at MIT. So um, now there's this well-documented phenomena that the more anthropomorphic a system is, uh, the more easy it, it is to engender trust in that system. Um, and so if you think about uh, autopilots or flight management systems, um, with a pilot who is extremely highly trained, thousands and thousands of hours, um, the um, uh, if if that flight management system um, provides the prompt for the next action to the pilot in text, which is how it's typically done, there's some response to that. Um, if it in, if it's a woman's voice that um, conveys that same um, sort of directive. Uh, a pilot, um, uh, it's been shown, is is much more likely to accept uh, an incorrect directive from that flight management system right. when it's expressed with an with anthropomorphic aspects associated with it. So um, it's really not about engendering trust in a system, especially for especially for trusted applications. Um, you you really need to think about calibrated trust, and the anthropomorphic aspects of a system can really undermine a person's ability to effectively calibrate trust in these systems. Um, and so I'm uh, very, very wary, you know, even if you don't make your system anthropomorphic, you have these effects, right. but with everyone you layer on, you you really, there's there's risks associated with it. It's really another set of design decisions that need to be considered um, more holistically. Is it, you think it's up to the, the machine to do that? Like, is it up to the machine to say, stop saying we, it's just you, like, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Don't give me a name. I'm just a machine. Or is it up to the person to to um, not do that? Yeah. Well, our our research shows that um, uh, there's uh, there's an important role to be played on the on the part of the machine in acting so as to effectively calibrate trust um, of a human interacting with it. So um, uh, and then you see a, a part of that in the the boom of, of, of research and the importance of explainable AI, one of the motivations for being able to explain um, 
the behavior of a robot or the output of a you know a classifier or you know a deep neural net um, is to be able to not just engender trust that someone will use the system, but for a person to build a conceptual model of how the system is behaving when they accept its output um, and when they don't. Um, and um, there's 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 design on that that side. Um, as well, uh, how you design those explanations, what models you choose that facilitate the use of, um, you know, one form of explanation or another. Got it. And Ben beamed in. Finally, I think Scotty got the beaming system working. As you tried to <laughs> come in a few times. <laughs> there we got that. Yeah, I was trying. I was trying to talk earlier, and I, I heard everything that Julie said, which is great. So I don't really have anything to add. But I'm I'm sorry that uh, my my computer was oh, no cooperating earlier on. Not a problem. Now it seems. To be yeah, that, 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 that is a funny reference. Like I always think about, you know, a lot of times sci-fi does like kind of kind of inspire the future. But then I kind of look at some of those Star Trek episodes and I see them like sprinting to the to the to the room where they beam, you know, beam people up <laughs> to get them up in a hurry. And you're like, wait a sec. Why didn't they just tell the machine to do it? Why do they have to run there and press a button? <laughs> <laughs> they have a computer they could talk to what's happening here <laughs> um so so yeah one of the one of the things i i really connected with in 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 your guys research was this this idea of like lights out like going from fully this this objective of fully autonomous suggests that you're not going to up the game that the goal is to keep the bar where it is and just automate uh, and make it cheaper to do it, not to not to automate to raise the bar. Um, and it, and I believe you guys, what you're suggesting is the big opportunities in raising the bar, not not just automating the bar where it is. Did I did I did I get that right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Ben. Yeah. Well, there are two fundamentally different types of innovation. One is optimization of a process that has a particular endpoint. So you know that I want to produce 10,000 of a unit and I want to do it as fast as possible. I know what the unit looks like, the designs are all specced out. And then the question is just, you know, here, here's the race, how fast can you run? Um, and there's, there's really important innovation and improvements in that. But the, the other question that I think is, is in many cases more important is how do we innovate toward an undefined endpoint? How do we make improvements in a product or a process that capture improvement, you know, increased quality, or might even take out a step of the race, like might might take the track of the race and point it in a different direction? So, you know, one is about how do we run as fast as we can on a ex pre-existing track, and then the other is how do we redesign the track to maybe make it shorter or you know um, of a higher quality or in a different material? And I think that that is uh, just as important of a problem that a lot of the companies focused on automation haven't been investing in or emphasizing as much as they could have because they're just focused on how do we get faster. Um, and I, I think, you know, Julie and I have been talking about these, the, a, a new series of, of AI-related technologies that put that question of how do you innovate in, in, in a less defined space um, in really sharp relief because these technologies have qualities that the classic industrial robots don't. They're highly flexible, just in their very nature, but they're not nearly as robust. So, so it's, a, it's a totally different trade-off when we talk about you know, text-based generative AI versus a robot that can pick and place you know, as long as it has a power source very consistently. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. an interesting concept when you think about uh, automating you know, what you do and, and automating for efficiency, because at, at what point where does lights out stop? I mean, does it, do you go to decentralized organization now and we don't even have a company anymore because it's automated and everything's automated? And like, where does that end? If, you're, if your entire objective is to automate everything, then, then what is a company anymore? Um, as, you, as you evolve the company through automation, then it morphs and becomes something else and at least you have something to chase. Um, do you guys like where do you stop when you think about lights out? Do you stop at just just a facility running on its own or or does it start to become the back office and then the management and then the board? <laughs> yeah. 
So, um, I, you know, I, I fully agree with Ben's um, kind of delineation, like, you know, uh, different types of types of innovation. Um, uh, and then and then also want to highlight, even in the case where, you know, you think uh, you think you have the problem solved, you just want to assemble your product as fast as possible, you're going to optimize it and it's going to be set. You know, I was really struck um, in, in the time I spent working um, in production environments, um, uh, deploying systems. I've, I've worked in aerospace. Um, we've 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 collaborated and deployed systems in, in automotive. Um, I was out on an automotive line, and um, and there were uh, there were associates that were taken off the line that were just like slowly taking apart the car and talking to each other. It was like a mature product, a mature assembly line. And it wasn't a new, it wasn't a new model. <laughs> and then, and then slowly putting it back together and discussing. And I said, oh, what, what, they've been at that a long while over there. Like, what are they doing? And my, my collaborator um, said, oh, they're, they're innovating in our assembly process. They're uh, looking for ways in which, you know, we can assemble the car more efficiently. Um, and, you know, when you think of these, like these learning curves of factories, they're very well defined for aerospace, for, for automotive. Um, you never, you never like you, you never optimize it and just get it perfect in in advance. But you're you're climbing this curve, and it's it's a, it's the human's role um, to to innovate and to advance that um, that learning curve. Um, and so, you know, any any lights out system by definition <laughs> like, freezes that, which is like not not what many people really want in the in the long term. And so the question then becomes, how do you gain the benefits of, of automation systems while really building in this ability for humans to um, to improve and, and innovate in the process? Um, I think that's that's the big opportunity. Yeah, we talk about that a bit in our book, too, how there can be this cool symbiotic relationship between machines and humans where machines are given freedom to do what they do really well, which like, you know, repetitive process automations, things like that. And the byproduct is that they're freeing up more time for people to be creative and pe people can spend some of that creative energy improving the automations. So the, the humans are helping machines be better at being machines and the machines can kind of help humans be better at humans, which uh, it, you can make it sound pretty simple, I guess, but obviously that's, that's a, a high mark to hit. <laughs> do you, do you feel like um, there's overlap between uh, the work being done in robotics and then uh, things like chat GPT kind of opening up the conversational side of technology. Are you seeing a lot of interest and overlap there? Yeah, well, um, you know, on the, you know, on, on the, on the technology side in my lab, it's uh, there's a lot of buzz. There's a lot of buzz. Like we work in human robot interaction and then, you know, uh, you uh, need to constantly be able to evaluate and discern, like, what is the state of the art? What's an easy problem? What's a hard problem? Um, and, you know, I, I agree with, with, with Ben's sentiment and, and comments that like when we talk about the GPT family of technologies, there, um, in, our, in our HBR article, we, we talk about some of the challenges around design, implementation, making the business case to be able to fully utilize these technologies and, and scale them. Um, and, you know, a robotic system and even, you know, uh, AI, I mean, you know, uh, not by and large, but almost uniformly, it's designed to do very specific tasks up until very recently. <laughs> and, you know, you hone it for a very specific task and it requires a lot of resource. Like whether those resources are being, you know, put into, you know, uh, cultivating your training data or they're translating in a more manual sense, like human domain knowledge, um, uh, high, high bar and effort towards making these systems work the, the way they need to work. And like the, ver the very interesting thing and the promise of these foundational models is that they're very different and that they are extremely flexible. Um, and the, the ways in which you interact with them, uh, it, the, the expertise required to be able to leverage them and make use of them is very, very different than, than, you know, than um, the other types of technologies we've worked with um, to date. And so um, I think it raises different questions. It raises a whole new set of questions about you know, this, this is very flexible technology that, that's highly accessible, but with like important flip sides to it. Again, I mentioned I'm in the, the aerospace department. These are brought many set of applications where we care very, very much whether we know whether the output of the system is something that can be relied upon. <laughs> that's correct or incorrect or 
<laughs> right. And then you, you know, yeah. Uh, and how you, how you, uh, but you know, people are, are flawed in similar ways. We have like well characterized biases and heuristics that we use, and yet we're able to perform at the highest levels in, in the most complex task air traffic controllers, you know, fighter pilots. And it's because no, no human on their own can perform at those tasks, but we, we design structures and systems and ways in which people are going to cooperate and cross check and different types of expertise that are brought together um, such that we can perform in those ways. Um, and so I think it's a very exciting opportunity to to um, to really, um, you know, very aggressively understand how this is a technology that fits together with the other capabilities we have to achieve achieve high performance in, in, in tasks where you might initially think it might not be well suited for. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up precision because that was one of the the areas I wanted to talk about because um, the idea that that uh, a technology like chat GPT, like large LLMs, allows us now to talk to machines, right? And then and then instruct machines, especially physical machines, right? That that dangerous physical machines like cars. Um, and and th there's a reason that like coding languages exist. It's around precision, right? It's around being precise about what your tr your intentions are and what you're trying to do. So if 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 English or, or just language in general was a precise enough uh, uh, medium, then then why wouldn't code be language already, right? It's it's not precise. And so if if this becomes the new coding language for our machines, is this dangerous? <laughs> to that point, like we're we're imprecisely and so this idea that, you know, oh, now we can code through language and the language will produce code. And, and now, and now the person doing it doesn't need to understand the code. Now we have this precision problem where machines are like, you know, running over people because, oh, I didn't mean to say it like that. Or you misinterpreted what I said. Uh, that, that idea of precision, um, where does that fit into all of this? The, and, and on a danger side, right? Like, is is language the the way we're gonna get machines to do what we need them to do, or is coding here still so, needed? So, what's more interesting to me about language is the modality for interaction. But I can come back to that. But what's more interesting to me about about this is that um, uh, we talk about in the HBR article the real the importance of making these technologies more accessible to those with the domain expertise and being able to lower the burden for them to work with the systems. And so I see how you immediately jump to thinking about the large language models as being like, well, language is the natural way that people interact with other people. So maybe this is the way to to achieve that. Um, but um, you know, domain, for many tasks, like deep domain expertise is, is required. It's not necessarily a compact process to translate that even to another person. I, I learned through collaboration with Ben um, and the, the, the research we've done in manufacturing firms, it can take like a year and a half to train up someone <laughs> to do a task like like proficiently independently. So then I'm like, oh, no wonder it's so hard to train our robots to do, you know, even you know, relatively simple tasks. But the, 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 the work that's being done is, is, is complex and it requires significant domain expertise. So the question becomes, how do you translate that? And the, the large language model is the latent space that's learned from ingesting such large corpora of multimodal data is like potentially a, a very important bootstrapping tool um, to be able to take relatively then little information, but the one the one the information that's necessary for the bespoke task or the bespoke setting, but be able to leverage uh, much of what we think about as sort of common sense knowledge about relations and um, and things in the world. Um, I think that's enormously exciting. the The interface of like um, directing a system to do something with language. So um, I have bad which is that <laughs> our, our lab was Not more bad news <laughs> on this and it turns out that you know like there's um you, you know, even if you want to be more precise about what you're expressing to the machine there's like these well codified translations between natural language and these sort of like temporal logics or these logical specifications that a machine can use to compile or a robot can use to compile a program um, and, you know, you, there's no uncertainty about how the natural language translates into that logic, which is like a good starting point. But even if you use those, those means and you have someone that's a deep expert in temporal logic and understands the operators and understands like mathematically how the system will compile to produce the program, 
like years and years of deep domain experience in this little area and you want them to express the system do something like very simple like visit a few waypoints and avoid a few areas where you're worried about collisions people can't do it like there's like no one pass forward from a person to a machine they don't understand what they've conveyed we can show that via metrics the system uh obviously people aren't don't typically make explicit all, everything they need on the first path uh, pass. And so much like humans, like we we take feedback and we quickly refine and we quickly are able to correct. We have this very rich way that we do that in an interpersonal setting. We lack that for machines. Any one way passive information of commanding another person, like we know in the human world is like destined to failure. Like the person's not going to reflect their understanding of what you asked them to do. You can pretty sure they're not going to come back having done the task the way you you intended. Um, and so that feedback loop is is crucially important, supporting that feedback loop for a person to uh, see reflected back what they conveyed, do the difference between what they intended to convey. Um, and the um, uh, I'm not sure that the large language models make that process easier. Um, it gives you a lot more flexibility. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not I'm, you know, um, th I think the jury the jury is out exactly how you use them to help in that in that process. Yeah, I mean, we, we kind of look at large language models as um, a front end, an interface looking for a back end. But I, I think if, if you're not, you know, working with technology every day, uh, it's easy to think that it's this complete solution that can do all these things it can't do. But but obviously there's it lowers the barriers between humans and machines, but but there's a huge missing component to it. It's just such a small piece of, of what automation entails. Um, and, and I think, you know, we talk a bit about in the book, the need to just iterate and get going right away, especially with with just invisible machine type designs where you're creating these automations, like, you know, find a safe space. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in the, in the HBR article, you mentioned uh, Mass General Brigham kind of taking that approach where, where, you know, you find the people on the team who understand what you're trying to automate and have them working with the technology to kind of create those automations. And and ChatGPT certainly, it might make that easier. It certainly, I think, helps people see that as a path to communicating with machines and kind of uh, shortens the on-ramp a bit. But but it is, there's like so much collateral damage. And it's, I guess it's probably different with robotics too, because you can't really like test as uh, willy-nilly as you might w with something more abstract. Uh, One of the things I worry about, and, and I've seen, you know, because it's such a low barrier to entry to plug in uh, a, a you know a new GPT driven chatbot in your software, you see a lot of companies I think using it um, in ways that could be damaging uh, because you can't really predict where it's going to make errors, right? It could just have factual inaccuracies in totally random places, and you don't really know how it came up with that or how it could be fixed in the future. And if you give it the same prompt again, it might not have that inaccuracy. Where if you're dealing with um, someone, like, for example, if we're asking a student to do a task, um, we, have a, we have some idea of the high likelihood errors they would make and the low likelihood errors they would make, and it would make it easier for us to fact check that um, document and edit it or, or whatever the task is. So I do worry in particularly tasks where quality control needs to be high, and, and like you say, precision needs to be high, that the, the task of editing and quality checking the output from these type of probabilistic models, it's, it's really challenging. And I think it's going to take a different type of fact-checking mind than is currently present in, in some industries. So. Um, I'm, I'm encouraged in part by the experimentation. I know there's been a lot in kind of the marketing and sales world around drafting emails or finding, you know, customer audiences where, you know, if you make a mistake, it's probably not the end of the world. Um, but, but the the idea that the, the technology just is never, the plan isn't to make it completely robust because that's not how it's designed. Uh, that limits the amount of use cases that, that it can can operate on its own. Um, and I think it also makes it so that there's this, uh, clearly a skill shift where certain skills like fact-checking, editing, ma supervising that type of algorithm are, are really um, the demand for those skills we imagine could go up. Yeah, and it has this weird uh, ability to project 
a sense that it's thinking or that it's making decisions when it's really just you know it's just predicting things it's not there's not actually a sense of self there uh so there's that danger too um and yeah i guess maybe that's an anthropomorphism thing like we were gonna, talking about gonna, yeah 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 i was, I was I, that's exactly what i was going to bring up back to the anthropomorphic <laughs> discussion it, this is like um uh i mean it's preying on all our human weaknesses uh, because it's uh give it's saying things that appear to us to be plausible and very human like and then that that engenders um uh in 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 our in our minds in a very well documented way this our own generalization if it can converse and uh in this way then in a human like fashion it has these other human capabilities that i do as well which it very much doesn't so um and uh and you really have to counteract that to be able to parse through what are its strengths, what are its weaknesses, and how you um, how you integrate that into a system that's able to compensate a system that also inclu- includes people in a in a supervision or oversight role. When you, you mentioned Julie, kind of training people to use the technology, it feels like that's a big piece of it too. We were talking about Roombas, and I remember like the very first thing that happened when I plugged a Roomba in was I wanted to give it a name. And then I left the room and came back and it was like clogged on a carpet and I felt bad for it. Like I felt like I'd let my Roomba down. So I think there's this knee jerk reaction to want to connect with machines. And now that we're seeing with these conversational interfaces where it it, it feels like it's connecting with you, even though it's not. So there probably is a very important piece of this is training people how to recognize the limitations of technology and define what the relationship between people and machines should be in all these different settings. Yeah, Yeah, one of the things I I was, uh, you know, I've been exploring is this idea of like the, what is the real danger? You know, there's always the the perceived danger and the emotional danger, but what is the real danger? Um, For me personally, I could speak and say that the danger for the GPS is uh, for me is, is when I'm halfway to where I'm supposed to go and the battery dies and I don't know how I got there and I don't know where I'm going because I wasn't paying attention at all. I was just deferring the cognitive load entirely to the machine. I have no idea where I am. And then I go, imagine this is my whole life. Imagine that I just, that, that machines now are my GPS to life. And so I, I, I don't know what to eat next. I don't know where to go next. Um, and in a factory where cobotting is like this thing, does is the real danger that people just defer, not intentionally, but unintentionally, just cognitively stop thinking, and then and then and then get uh, get sort of placed in this. They're not observing, right? They're they're just not observing anymore. It's like it's like saying having a driver. Uh, in a car that's driving itself, they stop paying attention. Yeah, yeah. So skill degradation is is real. So um, the, the um, think about you know pilots and cockpit automation um, and those those flight management systems. There's um, a reason why pilots are are trained and are required to remain current on flying the aircraft. They have to manually do a certain number of takeoffs and landings. You know, in a in a month or a set a set time frame. Um, and, um, the, uh, and in addition to that, you know, the, your, your, your commercial airliner is, is flown, you know, basically fully automatically for 99% of, you know, you know, the vast majority of, of flights. Um, but, um, the pilot, uh, you know, is their, their job didn't become easier and you know, you still have two pilots. <laughs> their job actually became harder and their training requirements became more substantial actually as, as this, um, the, the automation was introduced because, um, in addition to learning how to fly the aircraft, they're also training on the technology. People need to train on technology, um, for, for these reasons. And they're not just trained on how to operate the technology, like what buttons to push or how to pull up the map or how to, you know, click like you know, proceed. Um, but they're, they're even trained in, um, in, in, um, in communication. So pilot co-pilot teams, they have active crew resource management training on how to communicate effectively with one another, what information needs to be provided when, how their actions mesh and how communication plays a, a role in that. And when cockpit automation was introduced, they actually have to undergo crew resource management training 
with the technology because it changes the way that the pilots communicate with one another and the information needs. And it actually makes it more critical that they're that they're communicating effectively so that they can be able to uh, understand when uh, to rely and when not to rely on um, on the automation. Um, and so I, you know, I, I, uh, but we have the <laughs> safest air transportation system in the world in the U.S. I mean, there are, are it's enormous, it's incredibly safe. It's mind boggling how safe air travel is. And that is because of the introduction of automation. And I think that we have the same potential here for, you know, these new technologies to really like up the level on what, what we can all do and how and how productively. But I think that we also really need to be realistic that it doesn't actually re reduce our role in many ways that we're going to need to train on this technology and um, uh, and and jobs will change, training, training requirements will change to be able to work with it effectively like that. Does it, does it and, sort of make sense to like build into the system and the design where the system itself actually ensures that you stay? So in other words, instead of just taking off landing, um, Every once in a while, it says, oh, you know, let's have you take off today. <laughs> let's have you land today. You know, yes, I just want to keep you. I just want to <laughs> keep you, you know, your skills sharp, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And it's not just pilots. Um, the TSA agents at the airport, um, they, uh, you know, they're, um, uh, so at, at some, you know, semi-random frequency, um, a threat will be projected on their, on their views. It's not from any real threat in the luggage. Um, but it's a it's a part of this element of vigilance. It's a part of this element of um, ensuring the person is engaged at the level they need to be to be to play the critical role they need to play um, for that human machine system. There's like well defined the theory around the signal detection theory that goes back to the radar days and how you set the threshold on on radars um, uh, to be able to you know balance like the uh, you know the misses with the um, false alarms. Um, but uh, it's uh, yeah, it's it, it yeah, you're you're exactly right. Um, all of that translates to these new technologies. So we almost think of like the human is the backup system now to the machine, and it, every once in a while it needs to test that the backup system is working. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know if I think about it that way necessarily. I think the um, similarly to how when you move up in seniority within a firm, you end up delegating and managing the tasks that you might have done when you're a more junior person. Okay. So I think, you know, similarly to pilots in a factory setting, CNC operators, you know, technically they don't need to learn manual machining because the machine's always going to make the cuts. But they learn ma every machining, you know, course, they're going to teach you the principles of manual machining even though you don't have to do it. And it's not because they really expect you to do it on your own, but it's like, it's this idea of learning how to understand what a quality part looks like, what principles the machine's actually using when it's going through the tasks, and that makes you a better programmer and a better quality person person down the line. So, yeah, I, I don't quite think it's... I, I imagine there's some strategy where you could think about a human as a backup, but I actually don't know if that would be the most productive at the firm level, because at the firm level, what you want is you want the human to think a think a, think as a supervisor that's trying to make the machine more fine tuned, more productive. And then when the machine isn't working or makes a mistake, that person is going to have sufficient knowledge and insight to correct that to identify the mistake and correct it qu quickly. You mentioned the Mass General Brigham, uh, you know, concept. They have a really interesting process. You know they use robotic process automation. It's it's not it's an old technology, um, and what their goal is to take repetitive tasks and hand it over to the machine. But they're actually going to use the same process with more sophisticated technologies, including you know AI decision support systems, and and they can do that because they now know how to access domain experts, know how to train domain experts in the technology, and know how to go through and you know uh, really measure a process and pick out the parts that can be automated. So I, I do think moving that person into more of a supervisory role where they do very valuable work and they can actually be paid more rather than less um, is is the way to go versus just thinking like, oh yeah, that you're going to have the person, they're going to jump in when the machine's right. down for one reason or another. So other. we got these design patterns for human in the loop, right? Potentially like a uh, human as a backup, human as a supervisor, human as a, um, and I, I, I wonder if, if a lot of that's a continuum, like is 
are, are you the supervisor of the machine until the machine learns enough that it starts supervising you? And, 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 and is that what people are afraid of? And, and should they, because at the end of the day, you're still the decider, even if you're being supervised, right? You're, you're, you, you can still turn left and it will recalculate, right? Um, is there that fear that at some point that they supervise you, it, it, it's, it flips rules? Well, I, th I think um, back to like the, you know, a, a human's role in, in innovation, um, the, you, you know, um, that ensuring that your, that, that your person has like the knowledge and expertise to be able to help drive that innovation process. It requires the foundational knowledge and expertise of the process, but then also, you know, the technology. Um, and that capacity has to come from somewhere. And so we, we've seen, you know, really, um, really exciting examples in firms where that capacity actually comes from automating in the process. So, right. pers you know, one of the um, operators said, I was just crazy busy. I used to be crazy busy bouncing between these machines uh, and keeping them going. And then when this automated system was introduced, I was able to go move towards supervising multiple machines. And now actually... Uh, I have the mental capacity to be able to look at all of this and think about how do we do it even better? Um, and, you know, just think about like the, the difference in um, realizing like, you know, a human's potential versus like, you know, being so busy feeding machines to being able to step back and, and drive that positive feedback of even further improving the process, improving productivity, improving opportunities for um, for upskilling, you know, individually or for others. Um, so, um, you know, I have a, yeah, I, the, the the design templates i think you're right i think like there's a there's a continuum but we don't often talk about uh the design template that engages the person in that way and moves them along a trajectory to be able to um i don't know accelerate that kind of positive feedback loop you know rob one so, so the question around you know will the machine you know who's the boss right, right. really and and um I, I see that in some domains, we certainly are responding to cues that machines give us and they're affecting our behavior. So, you know, this is a classic idea about the panopticon that when you're observed and surveyed, you're going to behave differently than if you felt like you were private. So workplace surveillance techniques or monitoring on workplace, you know, enterprise software, those could change the behavior of workers where they don't feel like they're working independently. They're working because of the, you know, in response to being monitored, but the I don't think that's the the behavior change there is because the machine's monitoring you. It's because you think that your 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 human boss right. might be be perceiving that. Similarly, with the studies on social media and responses to social media cues, right? It's not because the social media just the feed of the social media. It's because of the people behind that whose whose opinions or perceptions you're worried about. Yeah, like a selfie. Um, a selfie so, isn't. You're not nervous because because it's just you, right? It's 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 not a Zoom call. <laughs> it's a selfie. I, <laughs> You're I, not being observed yeah, think, unless you choose. I think that's fair, and I'm not trying to say here that you know technology is neutral and and people are the only problem, right? Technology can certainly stack the deck in in one way or or another, and and you know play on the behavioral tendencies of, of individuals. But here, what I think is important with these tools. Um, is that you can you can use them to make jobs better or you can use them to make jobs right. worse if you pair them with tactics like workplace surveillance or very rigid um, kind of you know rigid job designs that type of thing so there's certainly ways that you can use te you know automation technologies to promote drudgery yeah. <laughs> that's that's very doable and in some cases we see that but they're also flexible enough where I think you can like Julie described really free people up to be more creative and to to take jobs that have become worse and worse over time including some factory jobs that no longer pay as well as they used to compared to alternatives and make them significantly better right. and more interesting and more creative yeah one thing uh, I, I I really wanted to, to ask you guys um, because I have I have a, a opinion on this, but um, is AI the term anthropomorphic in itself? And that what, all we're really talking about is dumb machines becoming smarter on a continuum, and and AI is a red herring, and it's just throwing us all off because we're just talking about a skill saw that can recognize the difference between a piece of wood and a finger, or a car 
that no longer and and that machines are already killing us and 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 maybe just smarter machines kill us less often and it might be the actual remedy to the dumb machines that are killing us today and that ai is just it's it's just making everybody go off topic yeah you know there's there's an old joke that when i started in 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 ai and um and it still exists today but you know ai um uh so uh it's the it's the ai paradox which is that once ai works you don't call it ai anymore <laughs> the ai is like the biggest circle of the venn diagram of like what we work on so you know like voice recognition technology like when you're like uh, option three on the phone like once that was AI and then it just became, you know, something we interacted with in the phone on a daily basis and it just worked. And Google search, uh, you know, is AI, but we don't think of it anymore because it just works in the world and, we, and we're, familiar, we're, we're familiar with it. So the joke is that AI researchers are always destined to be working on something that like almost but not quite doesn't really work. <laughs> um, <laughs> and yeah. it's just been really like, you know, that's how I was introduced to AI when I started in the field by like my PhD advisor. And uh, and like now I have like enough of a, you know, a career to actually like see this happen many different times. You're like, oh, this is a real thing. So it's interesting to see, like, what is the next thing that is no longer AI to us? Um, but within AI, then there's this like subset of AI, which is machine learning. And then there's a subset of machine learning that is deep learning. And then there's this, uh, you know, subset again, or, you know, um, uh, that is like artificial general intelligence, um, which is, you know, AGI, which is what many people are sort of concerned will be the thing that can do, can do everything. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, with, with the increased compute and capability, I mean, just the, the advance in capabilities of these systems is really astonishing to me and other, other yeah. AI researchers. It's a really exciting time. And what, which one of these are going to become the thing that we no longer call AI like in a few years? Like, I can't wait to see. Right. And it's, it's almost, a, uh, you know, it's circular, right? The, the term AI is so imprecise. It's just an example yeah. of how imprecise the language is. And yeah. we don't even know what that is. <laughs> and, and AI is not a term you could translate into code. There is no code for AI. There's no like, there's no specific line of code, right? There's, there's no translation in, in Python or anything to AI. Um, it's and, kind but, of this amorphous moving target. Yeah. Um, do you think that we're in, um, uh, in a moment right now where we might be able to actually kind of set a paradigm in terms of the relationship people have with technology where we don't have to think of it as a supervisor. It can be an ally. It can be there to improve our workflows and actually like help us make better decisions. Uh, to me, I, I guess it feels like maybe that's a small window, but mm -hmm. maybe it's open mm -hmm. right now. Is, is that something you think? Yeah, you no, I think, I think it is a, it's a, it's a window that's open it has been open for a long time, and there are many great success stories of, of, of succeeding in developing AI or automation that that does exactly that. Um, but you know, I I think what's really salient to me is that the technology itself doesn't like deterministically set you on a future where uh, jobs become you know more and more constrained and you know are. Um, or, you know, or, or disappear. Or it doesn't necessarily set you on a future that you're describing, which is where we can, we can see all of these variety of benefits from the technology. But it's many, many different decisions around, first of all, how we how we frame the, the, the say, artificial intelligence that we want in the world. So in, in my lab, you know, the uh, one of the aspects that's unique about our research is that in our problem framing for the specific computational methods we develop, it's the optimization function is how you optimize the human machine system, not how you reproduce um, a capability or uh, supplant a human capability with some higher level of performance. And when you change that objective function for the capability you're developing, you end up with different technologies. So that's the, that's one starting point. There's a, there's design um, of the technology. Then there's a whole host of decisions you make and how you implement that technology that, um, uh, you know, is is it a surveillance state and you see all these negative, or, or is it used in a way that improves ability as a person to be creative? Um, uh, and um, and then there's like, and then what ultimately matters, who's very important is how you make the business case for that technology. Um, that in some sense drives everything else. 
right? And that's another set of choices you make. Um, and so, um, you know, it's really exciting to think about how we intentionally make choices in all those different ways that can move us towards what uh, what probably many would agree would be a more positive future versus yeah. you know the the, um, the the doomsday scenario. Yeah, I'm curious. Um, put you on the spot here. Do you guys? I noticed that a lot of people that are in AI, when talking to their peers, don't use the term AI. In fact, they tend to only use the term AI when not talking to their peers. <laughs> do you find that? Like, do, do you guys do you guys use the term AI amongst yourselves, or is that just a term you reserve for the rest of the world to understand what you do at a cocktail party because you don't want to explain what deep learning is? Yeah. It's it's not the term AI isn't specific enough to be able to use it. Like I would never go to one of my colleagues and be like, I'm an AI researcher, but in public talks, I'm like, I just so you know, I am an AI researcher. But you, you know, <laughs> there's like uh, you know, the the types of models that I innovate in are like very specific types of models. The applications are very specific types of applications. The studies that I run are very specific types of studies. And then we need to communicate like at that at a different it's not it's just not meaningful to 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 talk about it. As AI more broadly, um, you can't advance at, at, at the te- at, in the technical field without being more specific. Um, um, and I think it, it's uh, also very valuable to understand that you know these different parts of the field of AI, they're they're the strengths and weaknesses of the technology are drastically different. So um, I did my PhD before the you know before machine learning was really a thing. That's how old <laughs> I am. I know, um, and. Uh, <laughs> And I did my my PhD in artificial intelligence planning and scheduling. So, um, and you know that's constraint based reasoning. Reasoning, um, it's uh, you you have to encode a lot about you know, what's relevant to your task and the knowledge of the world. And you're developing these automated planners that are able to work through the sets of constraints that are very hard for people to think through. That's like totally different than you know deep learning. And you know, <laughs> yeah, um, they're all AI is the thing. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I wonder if, I don't know what kind of study you would conduct, but to conduct a study to see if the term AI is getting in the way of adoption of AI in a in a proper way. And like how much of that's just, we're getting in our own way by, by using an anthropomorphic term to the rest of the world. And because that's what I, when I read your article, I was like, okay, this is real. We're talking about, we're not, this is just, getting to the root of automation and not we're not talking about ai uh, beings you know uh that are machines suddenly taking over the it's just very (laughs) clear very practical um and julie how often do you get asked if if when computers are going to become autonomous or sentient yeah sentient question (laughs) 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 like josh i'm like it is a statistical model. It is like a. <laughs> I know. It's not fair to say it that way, you know. But it's like it's like a thing that you have. Tra- it has no <laughs> no intent for you. It has no no sense of self yes. with which it's interacting with yeah. the world to try to achieve. Like at least our robots have some like objective. Like they <laughs> <laughs> they want to affect change in the world through some sequence of action. You know, large language model doesn't. Um, so I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but suddenly it feels so sentient to people because they're having yeah. these conversations with it. Um, it's funny, too, because AI, I feel like, has the anthropomorphic problem. Then there's also just what we were talking about, how it's so broad. Um, you know, Rob and I both have worked in UX for a long time, and it, it was a very similar experience where companies kind of knew they needed UX, but they didn't understand all the little pieces that went into UX. You know, to, yeah. to different people, it meant different things. Yeah. So that that's a challenge as well. Uh, and I'm not sure how we'll overcome that. Um, but it does seem like uh, it, it's funny that everyone's, or not everyone, but a lot of people are fearful of the technology when we have so many discussions where it becomes clear that it's it's more about the people involved with the technology. It's, it's, it's a very much a people problem and not a technology problem uh, per se. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I find it, uh, it's interesting that yeah, you talk about aerospace and and cockpits because I, um, I was on a project that the Boeing Dreamliner cockpit um, design, and I, I we were just a, a member in it, um, mainly around the Jepson flight planning part, 
Um, cool. But uh, I had never flown an airplane before this project, but I did. I did sit in a simulator for the 787 after we had kind of got there, and I was able to take off and land with like 10 minutes of training. And, and that was a moment where I was like, wow, the whole world's about to change. But your point is really valid in that it didn't actually lessen the requirements of the training. It just made it so that somebody could effectively fake being a pilot, <laughs> right? But <laughs> which was like, yeah, I could take it like the 747. There was no chance that like, in 10 minutes Edmund. I was going to take off, circle Edmund. the airport and land again. Um, and yeah, yeah. I and mean, what you're training for is you, is not typically the nominal situation. You're training for the off nominal situations, right. which is harder. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and then more things to go wrong, more more complexity to understand, and then less practice because machines yeah. are doing it. It's yeah, very very interesting. Yeah, it's not hard to imagine uh, a partially automated assembly line where people are perhaps interacting with. Uh, robots conversationally, but maybe there's also this other layer of AI, we, I, I guess we'll call it that, <laughs> that is sort of there to manage that relationship or make sure that there's not complacency or that, um, you know, the cognitive load isn't shifting in the wrong direction, that there's still attention being paid. I wonder, if, is that something that's being discussed at all in your world? Yeah. Um, so, uh, I would, um, in the, you know, in the aerospace world and, you know, you know, you, you know, even industrial contexts, um, you know, I, I, I think these are relatively well, well understood that, the, you know, these are very important parts of the, the, the design considerations. Um, the, I, I, I think it's, you know, it's very interesting to me how, um, uh, you know, these these technologies they're leaving in the realm where you need thousands of hours of training to work with them uh, and you have people with very little training that interact with these systems um, uh, but they're essentially like a safety critical consumer technology um, and so um, I think in, in that sense I think you know it's a uh, uh, we're entering you know a different era um, and then the and even the, the design of the systems in their implementation the resources that are involved that make these systems function so effectively, you know, in one context, in aerospace or industrial, they're not translatable to the very lightweight types of, but but also, you know, really safety critical applications that we want to be deploying them in. Um, and, you know, th think about like the UI UX world and industrial um, engineering, you know, what, what translates and how you make use of these tools um, in a way that those come together so that you you realize the, the benefits of the technology while ideally avoiding the pitfalls we've learned through aviation and many airline accidents and mode confusion, which by the way, we have to learn all over again, for example, with 737 MAX. So even in a, in a relatively mature field where um, you know, we understand these phenomena, they, uh, it's, you know, they, they, they emerge again. Um, yeah. Well, it feels like everything has suddenly sped up even more than we estimated that it might. Are there, are there specific things that you think are mission critical right now that, that, um, people implementing this technology, whether it's robotics or, or more of the invisible machines, should really be paying close attention to? But, you know, the, the, things, that, the things that we should be paying attention to, um, you know, one of the things that's really fascinated me is, you know, in, in increasingly complex environments, uh, the scheduling, pro scheduling types of problems that Julie mentioned and that, that she works on, which are sometimes delegated to people without extensive uh, education. So, so non-college graduates are handling scheduling problems. But uh, what, what Julie's taught me is that not, not many people can actually pull that off, that these are extremely complex tasks and they're, they're skills that machines can't quite replicate. Um, and and it, it requires a certain ethos as well. So um, I am interested in how we um, design processes to highlight those, highlight and, and address those types of complex scheduling problems. Um, and, and, you know, scheduling, you think of just, just time and order, but there, there, I think, you know, there, there are many and varied in, in, in industry. Um, 
and also, you know, how we support uh, workers to operate in an environment where they are our supervisors. In manufacturing, we think about going from being an operator to a, a cell leader. And I think this idea of being a cell leader or a supervisor um, is, really, is really critical. And it's something that, you know, industry might adopt in this way. And then uh, workforce training uh, might also better prepare people to, um, to enter into that environment. Awesome. Well, yeah, thank, thank you so yeah, much, thanks, Ben and guys. Julie. We appreciate your time. This is great. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks again for tuning in to Invisible Machines. Don't forget to follow UX Magazine wherever you get your podcasts to hear new episodes. You can also watch this show on the Invisible Machines YouTube channel. Special thanks to the team at UX Magazine and the marketing team at OneReach.ai for making this podcast possible. And a big thank you, as always, to Michael Litvinov for making this podcast look and sound great. We are having a good time, and we're really excited to connect with you again next week on Invisible Machines. Mm -hmm.